grateful for you. Well, thanks, Chris. So um, I wanted to first just begin and, you know, kind of give us your story, how you became the president of Starbucks. What was your journey? Well, you know, sometimes you got to be lucky, you know, and I was kind of lucky. <coughs> I was uh, um, president of a land development company here in Seattle, and it got sold, got in trouble when we had to sell it. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I was in my mid 40s. And I met this young guy named Howard Schultz. And he was about 10 years younger than I was. And he had just purchased what was Starbucks coffee at the time, which were about 11 stores. And he was looking for a VP of operations for the company for sales and operations. And, you know, I was, I was kind of set on buying my own business. And so we met and about, uh, we went, had a breakfast meeting and he had 10, 10 criteria on his list. And the first one, do you have a college degree? I didn't have that. Second one, do you have food service experience? I didn't have that. Finally, we got down to number 10. Can you breathe? Yes, I could breathe. But unfortunately, you know, that wasn't enough for him. And I really wasn't looking for a job. And so we parted ways. And a year later, um, we got back together again. I won't get into the whole story, but somebody introduced us again. And I still hadn't found a business to buy. And he had still hadn't filled the position. And so I said to him, I said, why don't you let me work in the company for a week? For, I'll just work for free. I, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to work in the stores for a few days. I'd like to work in a plant for a few days. And I'd like to work on the trucks for a few days. And after the end of that first week, you know, fortunately, he extended an invitation for me to join Starbucks because I was hooked. And, you know, I, I figured out early on that this was a business was not about coffee. It, it was about people. And. Uh, so, you know, that's how I got there. It was just, uh, just kind of one of those things where, you know, where opportunity meets preparation and the opportunity, opportunity came up and I was prepared to take it. That's amazing. And how many years did you work as, uh, at, at Starbucks? I was there 21 years, including on my board, uh, being on the board. I love that. So I, obviously we've read your books and one of the things that I discovered in the book is that at Starbucks, you call your employees partners. Um, how has that impacted Starbucks success and what was important about that? Well, there were three people that had responsibility for leading Starbucks. I was one of them, uh, Howard Schultz, of course, and a man named Orrin Smith. All three of us came from not the same backgrounds, but similar in, one, in a couple of ways. Howard was raised, he was uh, raised by a very poor family. As a matter of fact, he lived in the housing projects in Canarsie, New York. And, um, and his parents had zero money. And uh, it, Warren Smith was raised in a farming community in Western Washington called Chehalis, Washington. And his father left uh, five kids and his mother and his mother had to raise five children and, and he had nothing. And I came from not nothing, but my dad, my dad was an immigrant, came from Bulgaria. My mother came from Latvia in the early 1900s. And my dad opened up a small mom and pop grocery store. And that's what we lived on. I don't think my dad ever made more than $18,000 a year. So here you had three guys that basically came from nothing. And we made a decision that, that we were going to do more for people than any other company in our kind of field had done. And that we weren't going to build the company on the backs of people. We we're going to build the company with people and for the people. And, and so we gave uh, everybody health care benefits right out of the gate. Everybody got equity in the company. And so the reason we call them partners is because they actually own part of the company. And, and so everybody, if you work 20 hours a week or more, you're going to get equity. That's where it came from. I love that. Um, my, my fellow team leader, Logan, are you on here, Logan? I was gonna have you introduce yourself and you've got another question. Uh, yes, ma'am. How you doing, Howard? Um, Good, Logan. The, uh, that kind of leads straight into the next question. Um, it's obvious that you're very passionate about your partners and the way that you guys do that and growing good humans. Um, can you share mm -hmm. how that's impacted the employee morale, the retention and the performance of your partners at Starbucks? Yeah, you know, when you treat people with respect and dignity, they treat you back with respect and dignity. And it, um, because we were what we call a servant-led company, in other words, we practice servant leadership, our, our role as leaders was to help our people grow first as human beings and secondly, grow as, as professionals. 
And, and, and when we focused on that first, rather than believing that they were there to serve us, right, that, that, you know, that people wanted to be part of that kind of organization. And so after a while, like attracts like, you know, once people heard that it was a great place to work, we treated people with kindness and uh, with respect and dignity, then people wanted to come and the people that are there wanted to stay. Now, of course, not everybody stayed. We had high turnover in, at, at, at the barista level always, because these were mostly at, the, at that time, mostly um, young people going to college or, or, you know, having a second job. But they, they stayed because of how they were treated, not because of the money they made. I mean, it wasn't that we didn't pay fairly, we did, but, uh, and they certainly had a lot of benefits, but it was more how they were treated, how they were recognized uh, when they did a good job and, and how they were coached when they didn't. And it was always done with them in mind. And so they wanted to stay. I love that. You talked about in the book that you guys had a small, you didn't really live by a lot of rules, but you did have the green apron book. Um, yeah. Can you talk about what that is and what one of your favorite principles was out of that? Well, <laughs> green apron Excuse book was, hmm. uh, was a, I've been doing uh, with a little... book that was created by a, a young woman named Jennifer Caraman. And Jennifer was kind of our canary in the mine shaft always. And even from the very early days, she would always remind us, hey, you know, we're forgetting why we're here or, you know, something's not right. And, and so Jennifer, I had retired once and I stayed on the board, but I'd retired from daily operations. And I came back because uh, right after the week of September 11, because the person that was the president of North America resigned abruptly. And so I was asked if I could come help in operations, supposed to be for three months and ended up being for three years. But um, and so Jennifer, I was there a week and Jennifer came to me and she says, you know, we need to write all this stuff down. We always had, our, we had our guiding principles and our mission statement, but we hadn't written down how we, how we live and how we work. And so Jennifer said, I have this idea. I want to, uh, I want to, um, uh, I want to create this little booklet that I want to call the green apron book. And in the green apron book are going to be all the things that we stand for, and I'm going to go through them here with you. I, I have to read. I'm sorry. I can't remember all of them. So the opening of the page of the book says, give, connect, and elevate. In other words, give to people, connect with people, and elevate people. Um, and then, uh, then, then it asks the question, why are we here? To promote an uplifting experience that enriches people's daily lives. So everybody had this little ap green apron book, and they carried it around with them. It was, uh, you know, so they could always be reminded of, of why we are here. The first, the first uh, value is be welcoming. Offer everyone a sense of belonging. The second one was be genuine. Connect, discover, and respond. The third one was be knowledgeable. Know what you're doing. Love what you do and share it with others. And then the next one was be considerate. Take, take care of yourself, each other, and our environment. Uh, and then, and then three other little words, make a friend, make a difference, make someone's day. And, and then it had more about them. But I would say if you ask me, which is the most, for me, it was the most important one was, uh, would have been be genuine. And because I believe in being who you are and we never asked our people to be something other than who they were. We didn't, you know, we didn't try to have them, you know, have all sorts of slogans that said, uh, you know, be nice, you know, we, we just wanted people to be human. And so under genuine is connect, discover and respond. And that means that, that you, you listen, you know, you pay attention to people and you care about how they're feeling and what they, what they're thinking. And I used to say to our people that we're, that the baristas are, they're social workers and they have, you know, 10 or 15 seconds to determine where that person is in front of them. Did they just get a speeding ticket for 200 bucks and it took up their uh, food money for a month or two weeks, whatever it was, or, or did they, their, their son or daughter just get a full ride to Harvard and they are, can't wait to tell somebody. So you, you had to use those little antenna that you have in your head and pay attention and listen with more than your ears. And so that to me, be genuine, connect, discover, and respond was the most important ones to me, important one to me. I love that. Thank you. Logan. Um, Howard, at KW, we have a mission, and it's to build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living, experiences worth giving, and legacies worth leaving. Um, 
what was the mission at Starbucks? Uh, every, uh, to be one of the most well-known and respected organizations in the world, known for nurturing and inspiring the human spirit. And not a thing about coffee, not a thing about how big we wanted to be, but just what we wanted to do and what we wanted to leave behind. I mean, uh, you know, and that became, that's the rallying cry. Nobody ever forgot that. Mm -hmm. And particularly the most important part, known for nurturing and inspiring the human spirit. You know, what does that have to do with coffee? Well, it has everything to do with coffee because coffee is consumed by human beings. And, and so we wanted to nurture and inspire their spirits. And I, I attached to that so much that that became mine. And, and mine, I plagiarize completely is uh, every day I want to nurture, every day I want to nurture and inspire the human spirit, beginning with myself first and then for others. So I live my life according to that still today. I just took it on and, and I'd had mission statements before for myself personally. I, I'd had a, had a different one for, you know, about 20 years. And, but this one just connected with me and it, and it has ever since. I love that. It, it, it becomes a just cause, which is which is really cool. So if you had to give advice to somebody who was running their business to create their mission statement, what would that advice be? Don't try to do it yourself. Involve your people. Everybody from every level should be involved in this process and should be uh, able to contribute to it because this was done by not the officers of the company. This was done by the people of the company, including baristas, store managers, you know, executives, uh, uh, people in marketing, everybody. We had about a hundred people that were involved in it. It took us about six months to get it right and to get it to where we just all attached to it. And so that would be the first thing I'd say, involve your people. And, and remember that it's not about the business. The, the mission statement's gotta be something that's bigger than you. It's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be done with the idea that it's got the purpose has got to be bigger than yourselves. It's not about me; it's about we. And so it takes it takes a group to do it. It takes a team to do it. And that's my advice would be is to do it that way and and have patience with it. It just it just doesn't come. Sometimes you know the words come quickly, but a lot of times they don't. And you have to have patience to do it and involve your people. That's great advice. Thank you. So we're, we're here in the first week of the new year and we've got salespeople on the, on the Zoom with us right now. Um, and you talked about in the book. People. I'm talking to salespeople. Oh, I know no. it. That's oh. hard to believe. You're right. So you talked about in the book about dreaming big. Um, what advice would you give to our associates on setting their goals for the new year and, and dreaming bigger? Well, you know, uh, goals are... They're, they're not the bottom. They, they, should be the, they should be the stretch. If, if you're always worrying about missing your goal, then you're never gonna set your goal high enough. And so, you know, we're all capable of more than we think we are, you know, and we should set, we should set goals that drive us and then have a plan to get there. Just setting a goal is not enough, you know, because, you know, and uh, it, has to be, it has to be done with a plan in mind of how you're gonna get there. You know, in your in your business, I got to tell you a story. This kind of I hope fits. So I, I live here in Palm Springs, California, and, and I have a nephew that lives here too. This is my wife's son, our nephew, and but he's my nephew too. Anyway, he's he has a relationship with a, another young man, and and that young man uh, came from. They were both living in Los Angeles. They moved to Palm Springs. That young man was trying to figure out what to do. And he somehow had gotten a real estate license, but he wasn't doing anything with it. And so I introduced him to, a, to a, a, one of the better real estate agents here in the Palm Springs area, somebody that I knew and said, can, you know, can you help this young guy get into the business? And so he did. And, and over about a two year period of time, he started setting goals for himself. And I'm thinking, man, these are big goals, you know? I mean, selling, you know, 20, 30, $40 million worth of real estate. And lo and behold, I mean, he went by everyone. He didn't set his goals high enough. This is a guy that was 26 years old. Last year, he sold $50 million worth of real estate here in Palm Spring. That's a, I, I think that's a lot. I think it's a lot of real estate. It certainly held a lot more than coffee, you know? So anyway, I watched him do it and he, he did it all because he, he went after it and he wasn't afraid. And I, and I was so impressed by that. I thought to myself, man, I, I, I've been slack on setting my goals and I still set goals. So bigger than you think is comfortable, you know, not so big that they're foolish, but 
but bigger than you think is comfortable and then have a plan for going after it. I love that. We say oftentimes that the goal is to inform the behavior and yeah. uh, you've got to set a plan for the stretch. So great advice. Logan. Um, Howard, you shared in your book that you value challenges. Um, yeah. what, what? Why, why, why do you value, value challenges? Well, you know, I think to live a fulfilling life that it, it, it shouldn't be a life that just you float through, you know, that all the the things, everything that makes a whole human being are, you know, are not happy, are ha things like happiness, uh, joy, uh, challenges, uh, success, failure, pain, suffering, disappointment. And so I think that you, as a, to be a whole human being living a fulfilling life, then you have to learn to deal with the challenges that come along in your life. If, if, you, if you're only dealing with the good stuff, you don't really learn any lessons. And so I learned the most lessons from the things that, were, that I struggled over. You know, I, I had a say on my office wall, there are no stressful situations, only stressful responses. And so, you know, that was one of the things that I always tried to keep in mind when I was facing challenges that made me uncomfortable. And, you know, that's what makes, makes you a complete human being. It's, you know, everybody wants to be happy. You know, I, I hear that all the time. Everybody wants to be happy. But happiness is only a part of life. You know, happiness kind of comes and goes. You know, it's all the things that go together that, that make a fulfilling life and make a whole life. So challenges are part of that. And I, I enjoy the challenge of, of stretching myself, being better than I thought I could be, struggling over something that, that, that was difficult for me. And, and that's why. And I'm, I'm sure your time with Starbucks, you had your fair share of challenges. Oh. Um, what, was an, what was an example of one while you were there as the president? And how'd you overcome it? Well, you know, I, I mean, there's just an endless list at Starbucks. When I first got there, I wanted to raise wages <coughs> because I felt that, that our compensation for our baristas was too low. We were basically at minimum wage. And I said, we have to be at least a dollar or two above minimum wage. And so... I, we did all the research, we did all the modeling, and we put a plan in place of how we were going to raise wages by about two bucks. And we, we figured out it would cost us about 1% of sales. And we figured out how we were going to pay for it. So we implemented it, and it was out there for a month. And I went on vacation before the first P&Ls came out that would reflect the increase in wages. Well, I'm on vacation. All of a sudden, I get this call, panic call from Howard Schultz. What happened? You know, our, our, our labor costs are, are two points higher than you said they were going to be. So, man, you know, I immediately rushed back from my vacation trying to figure out what had happened. And, you know, I thought, man, I've only been here a few months. You know, I'm going to be out looking for a new job real quick. But I got together with my team and we figured out what we needed to do. And, uh, you know, we didn't we weren't going back. Right, because it was the right thing to do. So we figured out what we needed to do. We had to increase some pricing. We had to delay some hiring and some things that we wanted to do, some other things we wanted to do, but, but we stuck with it and it was the right thing to do. You know, and you know, we have made mistakes right along. It, it's when we, um, uh, when the downturn came in 2007, 2008, uh, there was uh, pressure from, particularly from the board uh, to reduce costs. And so, you know, Howard wanted to do layoffs and I had been through them before. So I said, look, if we're going to do those, I was on the board then I wasn't in operations. I said, if we're going to do layoffs, then we can't surprise anybody. We have to do them with love in our heart. And we only want, we need to only do them once. Well, unfortunately we didn't do them once and we destroyed trust in our organization. And it took us forever to get it back. And it was because, you know, it, when you say we're going to only have one layoff and then you have two or three, you, to you totally break trust. And it wasn't that people didn't understand. They understood that we had to have a layoff. But, but when they felt that they were lied to. And when you do that, you know, it takes you forever to earn back their trust. We finally did. But it took a long time. <clears throat> What would you say to earn back that trust? What did that look like? Was it just, you know, re building, rebuilding relationships or what was a couple examples of that? Yeah, you had, well, first of all, you had to own it, right? 
it wasn't something that they did. It was something that leadership did and leadership had to own the responsibility for making that mistake and you had to apologize for it. And then, and then you had to make sure that nothing you did from that day forward uh, would break that trust. So you had to, you know, you had to be authentic all the time. I have a saying that only the truth sounds like the truth. And, uh, and you know, we had to absolutely live by that because if we had done it again, we'd have had, we'd had a disaster in our hands. If we'd done anything to break trust again, we'd had a disaster. We'd never gotten trust back. And so you have to just step up and own your mistakes and admit it. And, and it, we went around to everybody and had meetings and apologized for it and, and told them why it happened and what we, what we had done wrong and, and, and promised them that it wouldn't happen again. And it didn't. Love that. Um, so I learned through the book and that there were, there are different meanings behind the aprons and that there's different colors and, um, and such. And so as a consumer, I'd never really paid that close attention to the different aprons. What are the different aprons? What does that mean? Well, there's really only two. There's a green apron and a black apron. And the green apron is the traditional apron that we wear, the green apron. And that's everybody that works at Starbucks in the stores wears that apron. But the black apron represents, um, represents everything in, in the little green apron book. You have to be knowledgeable. You got to know about the coffee and be able to talk about the coffee. You got to be genuine. You've got to be, you have to live up to all the values and the principles in the green apron book. And you earn that over time. And you get these little, now they give out these little, they don't have the books anymore. They give out these little green apron cards that have all the values on them. And when you practice one of the values, you get a card. When you go through all the values and you know the coffee, uh, then, then you get the black apron. Nice. I love that. And I read too, that they are, some of them are embroidered with military branches and such. Oh yeah. 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 We do that. We do that because we have lots of veterans. And so we don't, you know, we don't, we, we put things on them, you know, to honor different people and stuff in different groups. Yes, it's true. That's really neat. Um, one person asked, what's your favorite drink at Starbucks? What's your go-to? Well, I'm a simple guy. I drink a triple tall Americano. No, no cream, no nothing else in it, just black coffee. So three shots of espresso and about six to eight ounces of water. And I have two, I have two of those a day, you know, and by oh. the time I finish the second one, I'm kind of invisible. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Logan. Um, Howard, you shared that there are six P's as a part of your ingredients to success. Right. You know what those are. Yeah. Okay. These are when I was uh, in my 20s, I read this book about how to live a life, how to live your life. And the first part of it, of it said, you need to uh, write down your eight to 10 core values. And that took me a long time to do it. I found about 300 words that represented human values. I got it down to 50, it took me a long time, but I finally did. And then, and then it said, you have to create a mission statement for yourself. Well, at that time I, I was in the home furnishings industry. And so it, it was something related to that. And then the third chapter of the book said, you need to write a paragraph or some sentences about how you want to live your life. And so I used words to do that. And the first, and I call them my six P's. So the first P is purpose. Everything I do in life has to have a purpose greater than myself. You know, it's not enough to just be doing stuff. It had to be something that drew me towards it and that served other people. Because I, I believe the only thing any of us are put in this world for is to serve other human beings. The second P is passion. If you're going to have a purpose greater than yourself, then you darn well better be passionate about it. Scream it from the highest mountaintops. Let everybody know why, why this is your greater purpose. Because you want something that gets you up in the morning and gets you excited every day. Then the third P is patience, or per, excuse me, uh, persistence persistence uh not you know we all are traveling down our rivers of life and in our individual rivers there are rocks now some of those rocks stick up above the water and it's funny how we hit those anyway well we've got to learn to get over them around them under them or through them some rocks we don't see they're below the water and we get surprised that and but we still have got to deal with those rocks and and then the other rocks a lot of them we put there ourselves you know, we, we, we create things in our lives that, that stun us and that we have to figure out how to deal with. And so persistence pays. You've got to deal with those rocks. It's just the way that it is. And uh, I've never known any entrepreneur that I wouldn't define by that one word. 
You know, Howard Schultz was the classic entrepreneur. If you told Howard Schultz no, that was the beginning of the conversation. And that's entrepreneurs do, and that's what you need to do in your life is, is, is be persistent. Uh, I always say, say to my children, I say, persistence pays. You know, at the end of the day, if you're persistent, it'll pay. Then the, the fourth P is patience. Now, I think that patience and persistence might be opposite of each other, but they're not. You have to be patiently persistent. Sometimes things don't come in the time frame you want them to come. You know, the knowledge that we gain, the results, you know, sometimes we miss a goal. And, but we have to have the patience to get there. We have to have the drive and the energy to get there. And we have to have the persistence. But, but sometimes you it, things come a little bit later than we'd like them to come. And so you have to have patience in life. And the most important person, you have to have patience with your, yourself. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just like the most important person you have to uh, persevere for is yourself. Then the fifth P is performance. <laughs> Look, we hate this because human beings don't like to be measured. You know, who wants to be measured? But the facts are we're getting measured every day. If any of you happen to be married or have significant others in your life, trust me, you're getting measured every day, you know? And they may not say anything, but they're thinking something. And the same thing goes on at work. If you're working with other people, you got, you're working on a team, you're getting measured by how you perform. And certainly your boss or your organization is measuring you. So you gotta get comfortable with being measured. You gotta get comfortable with the idea that life is about performance. Servant leadership is primarily about performance. It's about doing what you say you're gonna do. And so performance counts, you know? I used to, I tell this joke about, or kind of a story about you go home, before you go home tonight, buy a cup, a really nice bottle of wine, something that your significant other likes, and, and a couple of really nice Rydell glasses. And when you get home, say, honey, I'm home. You wanna have a glass of wine? And she's wondering, or he's wondering, what the hell is going on? Well. You pour that glass of wine, you say, this is your favorite one. And how do you like it? And she or he says, I love it. And then, and then say the magic words, honey, this is your lucky day. This is gonna be your annual performance review. You know, and it's a joke, but, but the truth is, you know, we do measure each other and we gotta get comfortable with that. Then the six P is people. Like I said, everything you do in life is about serving another human being. And we should never forget that. You will never get bored serving another human being. You may get tired, you know, you may burn out just a little bit, but, and you have to rejuvenate yourself, but you'll, you'll never get bored serving other human beings. And no matter what role you play in life, what job you have, whether it's, you know, a real estate agent, whether it's a barista, whether it's a, a fireman, a, a firewoman, a, a architect, a, a doctor or a lawyer, uh, a widget maker. But, you know, the lowly widget maker makes a widget that gets sold to a, a printing press company that makes a printing press that gets sold to a publishing company that uses a printing press to produce a magazine or a newspaper that gets delivered to somebody's home to inform or entertain them. That lowly widget maker, supposedly lowly widget maker, has a purpose greater than themselves to serve other human beings. So that's the sixth piece. I love that. And that leads me. Um, and I hope everybody took notes on that because that was one of my that's one of my favorite parts of the um, success and leading into, um, you know, you stand really strongly on servant leadership and, you know, Starbucks is a world famous brand of coffee. However, you guys energy and your focus definitely was working harder on caring for people. Why was that so critical for you as a leader? Because I, I always believed that it wasn't about what you were selling, it was about the who. And that uh, the people, look at, only people make everything. You know, I mean, coffee would be nothing without somebody picking it, somebody, somebody harvesting or somebody growing it, somebody harvesting it, somebody uh, processing, somebody shipping it, somebody roasting it, somebody serving it. You know, it takes human beings to do these things. And so I always knew in my heart that, Look, you, you grow the people, you help become, people become better people and you help become better professionals. The, the people grow the organization and the organization grows the business. And that's just the way that it works, like it or not. That's how you build great organizations, build great companies, whether it's for-profit or non-for-profit. So I always felt that if I focused on the people first, that, you know, that it would work. And it, it has always served me well. And um, it, if people always ask me, why, why Starbucks? 
There were 21 other companies in the coffee business that were equal or bigger size when, when I started at Starbucks. And, um, you know, yet, uh, yet we, we became the leading coffee company. It wasn't because of the coffee. I, I mean, I, I love the coffee and, and, and it's good coffee, but it wasn't because of that. It was entirely because of the people that worked in the organization and because how they were treated and in turn how they performed. And so I'm just a true believer. It, I, I've been down this road, I'm, I'm 77 years old. I've been on all sides of this conversation. I've worked in companies that treated people terribly. I've worked for bosses that were complete assholes. And I've worked with people, I've worked for people that, and, and with people that just treated people with tremendous respect and dignity. And I'm gonna tell you, without a doubt, without a question, the best performing companies were the ones that treated their people well. And, 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 and not just rewarding them with, it wasn't just, it wasn't money. It was, they treated them like I, we always say with respect and dignity and they tried to help them be better human beings. And that works. And it works not only in servant leadership is not just about work. It's not about businesses or, or, or organizations. It's about families too. Servant leadership is a way of life and a way of living. It's how you treat yourself first and foremost and then how you treat others. You know, I have, I've been, I'm a believer in affirmations. And so I've been doing affirmations God, over 50 years. And two of most important affirmations for me are these. Uh, I love myself unconditionally. I love myself unconditionally. And, you know, for me, that's always been important. It, ha <coughs> it hasn't always been the case, but it is certainly true today. And the second affirmation is I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. That it more isn't necessary to have a fulfilling life. And so I remind myself all the time, I am enough, I have enough, I do enough. Doesn't mean I don't set bigger goals, not the point, right? But that I am okay. I'm okay as a human being, just the way I am. And so that's why people matter. I love that. Thank you, um, Logan. That's awesome. Um, so we're obviously in very unprecedented times with COVID. Um, <clears throat> Through that and through this entire ordeal that we've been through, how has Starbucks managed to thrive? Well, I mean, it was the same way. And we, you know, I'm sure we haven't been perfect, but, but you know, when, when COVID hit, they, they kept everybody on, all the baristas. And even though people that didn't want to work because they were afraid, they paid their, they paid their uh, weekly salary and they paid their health insurance. And so they have responded terrifically to, to it. Now, you know, having said that, there was tremendous stress in the organization and it caused some issues and, and um, you know, within the organization where people rebelled against it. And because, you know, it was, there was no, it wasn't like Starbucks was intentionally trying to do something wrong. It's just, it was the nature of what was going on. And, uh, you know, we closed a lot of stores when we felt the stores should be closed. We didn't, if people were afraid, we just closed the stores. We didn't even, we didn't bother about it, but, but we, we just tried to do the best thing we could to serve the people and the organization and to serve our customers. And, you know, sometimes for some reason, you know, you know, customers haven't been so nice in many cases lately and because they're under stress too. And, and they kind of have been, you know, sometimes abusive and it hurts the people a lot. And, we always try to say, always try to say yes, but you know, we also had to stick up for our people in many cases, and and you know, I asked people not if they couldn't be nice to not come back, and but that didn't always happen, and that caused some problems in some stores. I love that. Um, what uh, one of my favorite questions to ask is, what's a one of the best books that helped you as a leader? Hmm. <laughs> well, there's been a number of them. Uh, the One Minute Manager by uh, uh, Ken Blanchard was an old book. You know, it's a thin little book, but I, I got more things out of that book, that little book about how to treat people probably than anything. Uh, another book called Living, Loving, and Learning by Leo Biscaglia, another old book. He, one, he, a lesson he taught me, you know, in the book, he, he makes a, has a quote about how he wanted to be a master bridge builder. And he would help his people gently cross the bridge and then break the bridge gently behind them. In essence, he wanted to grow the people, but not try to own the people. He, if he wanted to help people be better people and better at what they did. And if they left the organization, so what? 
that he had, he had served his purpose. So Living, Loving and Learning by Leo Biscaglia. Uh, then, um, let's see, what other book? Well, uh, uh, Peter Drucker, uh, who was probably one of the foremost uh, uh, experts on, on leadership in the country, I think still is, even though he passed away. He wrote, there's a book uh, that was, I, I think, put together, I can't remember if it was after he passed away or before, but called The, the Essential Drucker. That is a really important book if you're in a leadership position. And if you want a book to be motivated, a fairly new book uh, called The Boys in the Boat. And it's a wonderful story about the University of Washington crew that went to the uh, Olympics in Nazi Germany in 1936 and wins, wins the race and what they had to overcome to do it. And it's, it's a wonderful story and a wonderful book and, a, and really motivating. That's great. I appreciate that. Logan. Awesome. Um, so obviously at Starbucks, you guys are really good at creating new business and bringing in new customers, but you're yeah. also really good at creating repeat customers. Um, in real estate, that's very, very important to a successful business. Um, what advice would you give to our agents that are on the call now um, to create those clients for life? You know, remember, they're not, they're not customers. They're human beings. And your, your job is to serve them in any way you can to help them have a better life. And if, if you create relationships that are more than just customer, I don't, I don't like the word customer because I think when you talk, call people customers, it's like they got a dollar bill pasted to their forehead. And if you just say the right thing, you'll get the dollar bill. I think we do what we do because we genuinely care and love human beings. And if you do that, they're gonna serve you back. I mean, uh, you know, people come back because they like how they feel when they're with you. And, and so that's what you want to do is, is build real relationships, not, not phony relationships, not economic relationships, but human relationships. And if you do that, then they're going to stay with you. You know, be around even when they don't need you, even when they're not buying a house or selling a house. You know, pay attention to them and do it with authenticity. You know, don't send some kind of postcard that doesn't even that you haven't even signed personally out with some slogan or something on it. You know, send a card that you've written out. You know, I used to send company and birthday and anniversary cards to everybody in the company. Personally, I wrote every card myself till we had about 10,000 people. And it, it was a big effort on my part. You know, I did them watching football games, watching sports. And when I was traveling on airplanes, I, I'd take four or five boxes with me and it was not easy. So, you know, that was like 20,000 cards a year. So, you know, I was doing about, you know, eight, 1500 cards a, a month. And, but let me tell you something. I've been retired from Starbucks for 10 years. I can't tell you how many people, even today, tell me that they still have those cards. They still have those cards. You know, people, hardly anybody gets a birthday card. It's amazing. And, and, you know, and, to, and here I was sending, out, their families weren't sending birthday cards and I was. And so do something that's personal, that shows that you really care. Not that you care about their money, but that you care about them. And so build a real relationship. That's an authentic relationship. That's how you do it. It's simple. It's just how you build a friend. It's just how you create a relationship with your kids and with your significant other. It's exactly the same. You love them. That's awesome. Thank you. I know one thing you spent some time talking about is, you know, we have two ears and one mouth and yes. you shared the proverb, compassionate emptiness. Yeah. Um, so, and it was about listening. Um, how hard was it at times as a leader to listen um, versus sometimes our instinct to solve a person's problem? And how has that practice strengthened your relationship with your partners? Well, uh, you know, I, I was a big focused on, I focused a lot on, on listening because I struggled with it. Like particularly men, you know, we want to solve everybody's problems. You know, my wife would come home and she'd tell me about her day and, and about a problem she had immediately, I would go into problem solving mode. Well, that was of course not what she wanted, was it? She wanted me to listen and my kids were the same way. One day I'm reading this book and here is this little quote, compassionate emptiness, compassionate emptiness. And it explained what it was full of compassion, but empty of solutions. And that really helped me, particularly at home. I was much better at listening at work than I was at home. 
honestly, until that quote came about. And, and every time I go to solve one of my kids' problems or my wife's problem, I remember that quote and I shut up, you know? And so, but you know, you don't only listen with your ears, that's the easy part. The most difficult part is listening with those little antenna that we have in our head that tunes us into other human beings. And I used to say the walls talk and you gotta listen to the walls as well. And, and the way, I, I, where I got this was, I was, I was my first real management job. I was managing a furniture store in Salem, Oregon. And uh, my boss used to come in and he used to say, Howard, before I, when you, after you lock up the store at night, before you go home, go sit in the middle of the showroom and close your eyes and see what you hear. And, he, and I'd say, what are you talking about? His name was Sid. I said, what are you talking about, Sid? No, you're not gonna hear anything. He says, yes, you, yes, you are. And I started doing that and it was amazing what I could feel. It, it sounds strange, but I, here, if you ever wanna try it, just go, when you go to somebody's home and they say, would you like a cup of coffee or something to drink? Say yes and go sit in the living room and close your eyes and tune in and see if you can't feel an energy. You, if, if you do it for a while, you'll be able to feel the energy wherever you go. I used to be able to walk into a Starbucks store. I didn't have to ask a question. I knew what was going on there before, just as soon as I walked in, because I could feel it. And, and so you listen with your ears, you listen with your eyes, and you listen with those antenna that make you a human being. I love that. Thank you. Logan. Okay. Um, Howard, if you were able to speak to your 20 year old self, mm -hmm. one piece of advice, what would it be? Figure out who you are, what you stand for, what your values are, how those values inform the actions and the decisions you make in your life. Have a personal mission statement that dri drives you. Remember, all this stuff can be written in pencil. You can change anything at any time you want. It's not, it doesn't have to be for the rest of your life. You can adjust and change. So uh, values first, uh, mission statement second, um, then a, a statement of how you wanna live your life, and then a plan, a written plan. All this has to be written down. If it's not written down, then it's just wishes, hopes, and dreams. Mm -hmm. So for, for my wife and I have been married for 45 years, we've always done, had a plan for our lives. And part of the plan was for our individual lives, part of the plan was for our married life. And we, we would go away for a weekend and we would take that, you know, that paper that has a little sticky up on the top and we would write on the top of each of these stickies, different headings. So spirituality, material, economic growth, uh, career, personal growth, health and wealth, um, uh, well-being, children, our marriage. We'd have all these headings and then we would each take uh, one of those pieces of paper and we would go into separate rooms. And we would write our, t our three to five most important goals under each of those headings. Now, some of them were just personal ones for ourselves. So our careers, you know, they were not, her career was different than mine and what she wanted was different than what I wanted. So we'd write those out and then we would come back and present to each other. And you can only ask clarifying questions. So sometimes there were some conflicts in there, particularly a lot around work things where she decided she wanted to get a PhD in social work and she had been bringing in, uh, uh, you know, bringing in economic uh, well, money during those times. And, and so we were gonna have to figure out how we were gonna survive without her money. But we solved that problem in the planning session. So all these things need to be written down. Most important thing, who are you? And what do you stand for, right? Uh, your mission statement, what you wanna leave behind, how you wanna live your life, and then a one, three, and five-year plan. It can be a five-year plan with one, three, and five-year goals in it. But, and then you need to review it every once in a while. Not all the time, but you, know, you should review it a few times a year and make sure that you're on track, that you're going where you want to go. You know, I used to set, uh, I set economic goals, how much I wanted to earn. I'd set goals for things I wanted to learn. I'd, we'd set goals for how, how we wanted to live our marriage. We'd set goals for how we wanted to uh, help our children grow. Uh, uh, things we wanted to introduce them to. Uh, we'd include our children in the planning many times. And so they became part of it and some other things. But it's, you know, have a plan, you know, there, that you probably all know the saying, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. Live your life with intention. 
don't just float around. Most people just float. And they wake up and they're 50 years old and they say, what the hell happened? Don't wake up at 50 years old and say, what the hell happened? Wake up when you turn 50 and say, well, God, look what I did. I lived up to what I lived up to my values and I've accomplished a lot of my goals. That's, That's awesome. incredible. I asked the um, audience, is there any questions we didn't ask that you'd like me to ask? Um, and what was a good one. It said from 11 stores to what seems like an endless amount now, yeah. what were the dis um, what were the deciding factors that led to scaling while protecting the company's stability? Uh, well, it, everything matters, you know, uh, it was people primarily. So, you know, I, I, I don't have it. That's the way it was. You had to have great people and you had to, you had, you had to give them room to make mistakes. Uh, I always say the person who sweeps the floor should choose the broom. And I mean that, that you bring great people in, give them room to grow, give them room to make mistakes, give them room to accomplish things. So people would be without a question. And then, and then you had to have access to capital. There, no question. I mean, we would never have gotten to where we were if we hadn't had early access to capital. And we took more than we thought we needed. And that really helped us. And then you had to perform. You had to do what you say you're going to do. And you had to be good at all aspects. You had to choose great real estate. You had, you, you know, you had to have, you had to serve the these human beings we call customers well. So they wanted to come back. You know, you had, you had to under promise and over deliver with your shareholders. And you had to do it all. There was nothing that you could miss. You know, and but prime, the most important, most important thing was our people that that everywhere we went, if you I don't care where you go, I, I had the responsibility for starting Starbucks International and open stores in 57 countries around the world. You know, we had to learn the cultures of each of those countries, but we had to be Starbucks. We had to live our values, you know, and so there were lots of things that were important to us that might not have been important in the culture. Uh, and particularly in Japan, when we first went there, you know, there weren't a lot of women in senior management. And we insisted, we had a partner there, we insisted that, that we were going to have a, a lot of females in senior management. You know, we wanted half the, half the women to be, uh, half the management team to be female. And we even, uh, uh, we, we had a uh, president of Starbucks Japan that was female. It was very unusual, but that was who we were. On the other hand, you know, we would, we would, um, uh, we would adjust if we had to have different products in different areas, we would adjust like if you know what the word matcha is, it's green tea. And so in Japan, we, we created green tea frappuccino and it was a big time seller there. And uh, there were other things that we brought from those countries back, but it was everything mattered. The details mattered. You know, like they, somebody once said retail is detail. Well, it's very true. But the single most important thing that mattered with the people that we brought on board and, and how we treated those people. Thank you. Is there anything that you wanna leave us with that we didn't ask you today or a piece of advice you'd like to give? Well, remember it's never too late to change anything you wanna change in your life. If you're not where you are, if you're not achieving the goals that you wanna achieve, if you have never set a goal, if you've never written down your values, you can do it right now. I don't care whether you're 25 years old or whether you're 70 years old or 80, you can still change your life. And all you have to do is want to do it and then do the things that are necessary to make that happen. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of challenging yourself. You know, live a fulfilling life, live a life worth living. So that's would be my advice and live it with intention. I love it. That's my word for this year. So thank you. Well, Howard, thank you for joining us today. I would love to hear some ahas from everyone. We'll go to the gallery here, but what were some ahas or lessons taken from our time with Howard today? You guys are all leaders, so speak up. I, I liked when he said you should, it shouldn't be a life that you flow through. You're going to deal with challenges and that's where you're going to learn the good lessons. And is it really stressful challenges or is it just stressful reactions? That was a big aha for me. That was great. I wrote that down too, Tara. Um, Diane uh, said not customers, but humans. That was another great one. Um, Brittany, most important is the people. And that's every, in every part of our life, right? Other ahas. Share away. No, I like relationships. Sorry. Go ahead. Authentic relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like personally, 
I like the fact that this man is in sync and he's compassionate and understanding. Yeah. That's, and I love his, his passion still at 77, right? And uh, amazing. Does that, does that remind you of anybody in our company? <laughs> <laughs> Mo Anderson. I love it. Who else? I, I love the, uh, the persistence patients, uh, the six know, P's. dichotomy there in, 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 in particular, those of the six P's and also just the last words you left us with that it's really never too late to start no matter where you are, like just to be intentional and keep moving forward and you can always make change. I love that. Um, Diana also added, listen with you, not just with your ears, but with your antennas in your head. That was really good. Um, and Melissa, her word is also intention. So that's helping her. Um, don't do it alone. Involve your people. CJ says the person who sweeps the floor should choose the broom. Taking ownership is huge. Melissa, remembering people are humans and let's and let them make the mistakes. Audrey also shared the broom. Um, anybody want to add anything else? Uh -huh. I'd say that the, the relentless, like the one word would uh, be people. He just said it over and over again. And so you couple that with the servant leadership. And I love the quote that he said, where he basically said that, you know, you'll just, you'll never get tired of serving people. Um, you could get tired of, you know, because it's not about the coffee, but it's about helping people and serving people. So that was great. Anna Allman added, people grow the organization, then the organization grows the people. So good add, Anna. Quietly listening to the room's energy. And Taylor appreciated the 20 year old advice. So Howard, thank you so much for your time. This is just an incredible way for us to begin our new year at KW. And we're, we're more than honored to have you on here today. All of you that joined us, I hope that you took a lot away from this. Um, go back and just reflect. We'll make this recording available to everybody to listen to and share and uh, happy new year. Let's go out and do big things in 2022, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I noticed a few people had worked for Starbucks before. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's and it's my daughter's favorite place to go get coffee. Okay. <laughs> so she's on here too. Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Amanda. Thanks. Bye-bye.